Hey, y'all, and welcome to Trials to Triumphs. I'm Ashley Blaine Featherson Jenkins, but you can call me ABFJ. This week, actor, writer, and producer Yvette Nicole Brown talks to me about her career and the illusion of fame. In addition to being my soror, Yvette is someone who I look up to in my career, someone who always comes across as her authentic self in any room. I've been incredibly blessed while doing this podcast to talk to so many other artists about how important it is to share our journeys with each other, including the hard parts, even if you don't immediately see the results of opening up in this way. Yvette reminded me that standing in our truth allows us to empower others to do the same. Sometimes what you go through is the way someone else gets over. They learn from your cautionary tale, but when you're so wrapped up in ego that you don't want to show that your heart gets broken too, or sometimes you want a job you don't get, or sometimes you, you know, have a financial situation that you can't get over in the moment. When you don't show those things to people, you're basically presenting as if life is sunnier on your side of the street, and it's not sunny anywhere all the time. Yvette has had major success as an actress on shows like Community, The Mayor, and The Odd Couple. She's appeared on Black Lady Sketch Show, Drake and Josh, as well as Dear White People. But she has also faced personal tragedy. Through it all, Yvette learned to move forward with grace and to welcome the journey life takes her on. You either lean into the experience of this life or you fight it. And we know the people that fight it. They just, you know, always mad and just, I don't want to, and I, why I gotta, you can, War against the circumstances of your life or the circumstances of your birth, or you can figure out this is a great puzzle and a great adventure. And in our Sankofa moment, Yvette honors an ancestor with a present day experience. And then take her to like a really nice restaurant, ha- let her get to have some really good food and have somebody serve her. Yvette, tell our listeners how we met. We met on the set of uh, Dear White People. Uh, I was playing uh, Calandria's, Coco's uh, mom. And uh, we met on on set and I found out you were my soror. And I just, I think I leapt across the lunchroom and (laughs) and embraced you (laughs) in a warm embrace and said, hello, baby girl. I was so happy to meet you and um, have been a fan because I watched the show before I was blessed to play a character, but... You know, you're just so solid in your work. And even more importantly, you're solid as a human being, which is even harder to be as a Black woman in America with what we go through, and especially in this industry as a Black woman with what we mm-hmm. go through. So um, I am, I just see you jumping from from mountaintop to mountaintop and everything you do is just with excellence. So it was an honor to meet you and to get to work peripherally with you because we didn't get to do nothing. Yes, I know. Not a we literally complained thing. about that the whole time. Like, we were like, can I just wait. pass by in the hallway? <laughs> something? Get way better or something? See you in the classroom? Go Way to go, baby girl. I don't know. Something. It's all right. Oh we'll my goodness. Yes, we will 1 billion percent have our time. Yes. Thank you. Those are the sweetest, kindest words ever. And yeah, yeah like we just instantly connected yeah. and we've been connected ever since. Yeah. And, uh, you support me like no other. You know that I support you always and forever. Always. I'm just so excited to dive more into me your story. Too. So uh, I always joke that like, you know, in in the industry at times, we're in a very like what's perceived as incredibly um, competitive. It's and I never looked at it that way. Mm-hmm. I never it's walked into auditions and was like looking around like, mm, I got to mm-hmm. get, I've always been like, Hey, y'all. If you got it, I got it. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Like, woo. That's right. Like, but this is the thing, Ash. Like, there's a lot of times, and I believe this from the beginning of my career, and I defy anyone to say that what I'm saying is not the truth. I feel like sometimes you find out about stuff for somebody else. Like, you're thinking that you hear about the audition because it's your audition. You might be the way that God can get that blessing to someone else. So he tells you, so you can tell the people. They're looking for us. Y'all better go on down there they're on the corner of people. They're and, looking and, for and, us. They're looking for us. That ain't, they're looking for us. And go on, get in there. Tell your people to call them. Go on, get in there. Because Listen. the thing is, nobody can take what's yours. There mm. are things, everything mm. that you have currently in your life, whoever is listening, everything that is in your life right now, it it, it had your name on it. So there's nothing mm. that anyone or anything can stop from getting to your hand. Now, there are things that we think are ours that don't come Oof. our way. And it, if it doesn't come your way, it wasn't yours. 
right? So if that's yeah. the case, if that is if that is a thesis statement by which you live your life, which is how I live my life, then mm-hmm. that means me telling you that they're looking for us. If it's for me, it's still going to come to me. But what a blessing if yeah. it's actually yours and it was told to me so I could get it to you. I feel happy when I pass somebody something that's their blessing. It ain't got to just be my blessing. Mm. Why can't we share? I don't understand this tight fisted way of going through life. I've never understood it. It doesn't work for me. I am yeah. happier and better and a more productive member of society when I share what I have. I don't get it. I don't mm. get the tight fisted folk. And they can't be happy. You can't no. Be happy. Your fist is tight. No, there's. There's no way. I mean, that's just, I mean, just, it's uncomfortable, first Absolutely. of all, right? Absolutely. That's just, to be walking around with your fist you balled up, that, that has to be, <laughs> that has to be incredibly painful. Okay, we're, I want to dive into that a bit more, a little bit later, okay. but um, I want to start at the beginning. So Yvette, tell me, what did East Cleveland give you? <laughs> uh, ooh, East Cleveland. First of all, I talk about East Cleveland a lot, and I feel like sometimes I do my hometown a disservice because I talk about it as if it's like the most difficult place in the world to be from. And it's actually the best, in my opinion, the best place in the world to be from because it teaches you resilience. It teaches you grit. Um, it teaches you how to play the dozens. I defy anybody to come for me. I can I can get anybody uh, mm. off their square from uh, childhood <laughs> conversations in East Cleveland on recess uh, time. It gave me my heart for people and it gave me my realness you know what I mean? Like I, I am a lot of things, but more than anything, I'm real. And anyone that has ever met me, they met me in the seventies or met me last week. It's the same chick. I have never changed. Mm. I never will change. And I, I got that from being from East Cleveland, Ohio. And my mama. Wow. My mama. And your mom and your mama. Let's talk mama. about your mama. Let's, talk about, Let's mama. talk about her. Let's do it. What do you want to know? What's your fondest memory of your mom? Oh God. With your so mom. Nice. Fondest memory. With well, your how mom. about I'll say this: maybe yeah. a fondest memory with your mom that you feel like greatly impacted who you are today. I'm sure there's a million, but just something that sticks out in your in your brain. You know, it's something that's not even my memory; it's my brother's memory. When my mother, my mother, we, me, and my brother grew up just with my mom. My dad and mom got divorced when I was very young, so he wasn't in the house. But my brother was in Boy Scouts, and there was a important overnight trip where the boys were coming with their fathers. And my dad couldn't go. And that meant if if a parent couldn't go, that my brother couldn't go. And my mother petitioned to be allowed to be the woman, a woman on this trip. And she went on this camping trip with the men and the boys and she held <laughs> her own. And I just, I remember as a kid just being so impressed that she, first of all, felt empowered enough to say, no, nah, wait a minute now, this is my baby and you're not going to keep my baby from going on this trip. To be a black woman to do that in the 70s in Ohio was very big. And then to win at it, like to say, I'm bringing my baby and y'all going to be OK with this. And they were like, OK, Miss Brown. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So I just saw I learned from that that you have to stand up for yourself. You have to stand up for your your people, your friends, your kids, your family. And um and and sometimes you have to go into something that's uncomfortable because I can't imagine that it was comfortable for her to be the only woman on this camping trip with all these men and these boys um, and might've been the only black family even on this camping trip, right? If I remember correctly. So um, that was a lot. And so I learned from her that Mm -hmm. you gotta, it's okay to to stand up for yourself as a, as a woman and put yourself out there. I thought that was really great. So that's a memory. It's not mine, but it's one that resonated about my mom. Mm, That's good. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, being uncomfortable with being uncomfortable for yeah. the better good, yeah. you know? For the be- it's everything needs to be for the greater good, right? Like, I think yeah. sometimes we make decisions. I always feel that if you're making decisions just for your good, you are missing the mark. Life is really mm. about so much more than what makes you happy or what brings you joy. And um, sometimes you got to make some sacrificial decisions for the good of other people. I just feel like we're not here just for ourselves. We're not. And I think that if you're living your life just for yourself or you're all about what can I get and what is for me, you really are missing the fullness of what life is supposed to be about, right? So sometimes you take it, take a hit or take a lick for the greater good of other people. I joke about this all the time, but it's actually true when I talk to people about voting and how it's important. And and we as Black women know this. We always vote for the greater good, not just for ourselves. But I don't have children and I vote for an increase for school funding every time I see it on a ballot because it doesn't have to be my kid 
that benefits. I want your kids yes. to benefit. I want yes. your kids to know how to read yes. and to have a good playground. So sometimes you, I'm going to pay more taxes, but if that means babies are going to have better classrooms or better experiences in school, why would I not pay more taxes for that? Why do I have to have kids to pay mm. that? See what I mean? But I think you have to think outside yourself and see more of the community or village vibe of life instead of just me, me, me. It's a lot of me, me, me. And that's a, that's a dirty bird. That me, me, me mess is a dirty bird. Yeah. Mm. What What parts of you would you say you inherited from your father? Oh, from my dad? My dad is an introvert. Yeah. I'm an introvert. My dad loves books. Are you? Love, oh my God. Wait, the biggest wait introvert. a minute. Wait a minute. Girl, Hold on. Girl. Rewind. You're an introvert? Girl, the biggest. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I know this is the thing. This is why people don't realize it, Ash. <laughs> I am an introvert that loves people. So I am constantly okay. at war with myself. I'm not shy. I'm not shy. I'm very outgoing. But people drain me. Like when I am, when because when mm. I'm in, I'm all in. Like you see me around people. I'm like, come on, tell me a story. Yeah. Me. I'm, I get in because I just think people <laughs> are delicious, right? I love them. But man, I, if I go to a party or an event, I got to sleep the whole next day. I can't, I can't go outside. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, my friends call me the brown recluse because I really, <laughs> I really do be up in this house. I be up in this house, girl. I don't be, you don't, let me ask you this. You ever seen me in the streets? You ain't never randomly seen me. I, you're Nowhere. Right. People don't see You're me right. up here. And then I go back into my cave. So yeah, so <laughs> I got that from my dad. Me and my dad, because I'm a, I'm his caregiver, so he's been with me. It'll be nine years in December. Um, wow. Our house is so quiet, actually. Me and my dad, we can go hours or days without speaking besides saying good morning. And, you know, I'll take him in his breakfast and I check on him. But if I go and sit with him, we in there quiet. Me and my dad are quiet, mm. quiet people. My mother was very loud. And, and when she was in the house, <laughs> you know, you hear her walking and talking. But me and my dad, totally quiet, pensive, book reading people. I got that from my dad. Oh, wow. Shocking, I know. All right. <laughs> yeah. I, but you know what? Actually, it's not. It makes a lot mm-hmm. of sense. I actually am starting to reevaluate how I view myself. I've always viewed mm-hmm. myself as extremely extroverted. Mm-hmm. But the older I get, I think... People fuel me in a really special way. Like yeah. I, I am very, I'm deeply inspired by humanity. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, I love documentaries, and it's because I yeah. love learning about real yeah. stories of people. And you know, I have mm-hmm. a whole podcast which is all about people's stories. But yeah. um, I too, but I'm in these streets. <laughs> I have to. My recovery is uh, it's 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 a uh, pretty long. It's pretty See? long, and it's pretty tough. What they say, this is what they say, Ash. They say that (laughs) introversion introversion or extroversion is literally just how you just said that you get energized by people, right? So if you, okay, let me ask you this. If you're going to a party, like if someone says you have to go to this event for your new show to promote your show, or maybe, no, no, I'm not Mm going to make it work because if it's work, we're going to go. A friend is having a a, a big birthday party and it's like, wear your white and come on out and we going to party all night. And you know, it's going to be about 200 people. All white party. All white. You know, the white party. I ain't never been to one. I'm so proud that I ain't never been to not never one of them. But they like these white parties, right? So you got to give everybody going to be in white and you got to go. Yes. Are you excited about the idea of this white party or are you dreading the idea of this white party? This will tell you whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. Mm. And you got a you got a closet full of white, so the white ain't the problem. Getting finding the outfit, <laughs> it's not the problem. So let me take that out the equation. You got your white. Are you excited about going to that party? Mm, that's the test. I hope he, I hope everyone's listening to the test. That's, that's the, the test. test you have to do. If you are excited mm. about this white party, especially if you're excited, not even knowing who's going to be there, you, my friend, are an extrovert. <laughs> if the idea of that the idea of that party. Gives you agita in the middle of your chest. <laughs> and you want to crawl <laughs> under your bed and hide. You, my friend, are an introvert. If you're somewhere in the middle, you might have a little bit of each. But the idea of a white party, <laughs> idea of any yeah. party. But a thing party, know. I can't, I, I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> I can't. I'm gonna send you a gift card. I can't do it. Oh my goodness. Okay, Yvette, this is what I want to know. What do you want to know? It's going to be a very simple question. Let's do it. But something tells me you're going to have a more introspective answer. (laughs) Okay. What truly brought you to Los Angeles? It's a simple answer. I wanted to be a singer. I was going to come out here to be a singer. Um, I had a record deal when I was a teenager. I was in the East Coast family when I was a teenager with Boys to Men. And 
BBD and discovered by um, Michael Bivens. And so when I graduated college, I was going to come out here and I was about to be a singer. So that's the simple thing that singing brought me out here. But the truth of it is I wanted, I wanted a new adventure. You know, I had done Cleveland and Warrensville and East Cleveland, and I'd been in Ohio my whole life. And I just felt like there was more than just mm. Ohio and nothing against Ohio, love Ohio. But I felt like there was just another, another level. And this is the thing, whether it worked out in entertainment or not, I was like, I'll just be in LA. Like I just, the sunshine and palm trees and, you know, the chance to be around entertainment, whether I'm in it or not, I just felt like I was called here for a purpose. And again, not necessarily entertainment. I wanted to be in entertainment, but I was open to whatever God had. So it was just another, another adventure. I needed a reset. You know what I mean? Sometimes you just want to see what else is out there. So, so when, if if this is what you consider it, mm-hmm. but when did the pivot happen? You know, I believe in life that you should run towards things that are also running towards you. And I was running mm-hmm. toward music and music was like, get out of here. <laughs> like, I loved music and music was like, you cute, but I ain't really trying to make it, make this official. And so I just realized, Ooh. I was like, it's not going to happen for me in that way. And I don't even regret it. Like, cause where the, where music went, cause it, I don't, people know this about me too. I'm very PG 13. And so there's a lot of things that, you know, you have to sing about that I'm not going to sing about. And, you know, and nobody wears pants. Everybody's in a leotard. I need to wear pants. <laughs> I got to I gotta wear pants. I don't want to show my boobs. Yeah. So it's all of these reasons why just music was not going to work for me. And so it was easier to just kind of go, well, I do like to make people laugh. And I do feel like I could act like I just I just had a feeling that it was in me. I'd done some stuff in high school and whatnot, but I I wasn't trained, but I just thought I'll try it because I'm a fool and and people love fools. So I could do it. Mm. And so I started doing commercial stuff. So the pivot was just realizing what was not working and figuring out another lane. And that's the thing that I think I try to do in my career anyway. Like as I'm going, like sometimes, you know, like right now I have a show on on Disney Plus, Big Shot, right? So we finished our second season and I've been off for like four or five months. I'm not going to just be off. I don't even know how that works. I've been working since I was 15. So it's like, Mm -hmm. I'll do voiceover or I'll go to hosting or I'll do game shows or I'll, you know, write a book or, you know, whatever. I'm going to find something to do. And so when, when, the music lane dried up and I knew that that was not going to be how I made my career. Then it was like, okay, let me pop over here and see what happens. Mm. So the whole idea was I I can try it and it's either going to work or it's not. I love, uh, you know, the analogy you're using of like, you know, I was running toward music and music was kind of running away from me. Absolutely. It, it takes an incredible amount of humility to say, that's okay. Yeah. But God blessed me with many talents. So I'm going to go and someone someone else might sit wallow in that for years. Yeah. And where does that get They're, you though? And where does it get you? Where does it get yeah. you? Because, I mean, listen, we've all been in relationships where the person didn't want us back as much as we wanted them. How did that feel? Is that a good feeling Ugh. with the unrequited Ugh. love that you're oh, pining for somebody? It's a horrible feeling. And, and you can be pining Ugh. for you know, a, a house that you ain't supposed to have or a job you're not supposed to have. I don't believe in in torturing myself, you know? Yeah. So, and also, listen, the, the ego part of it, I think everybody that has fallen in this world, most of the people that have fallen, ego has been the thing that took them down. And there's nothing mm-hmm. more uh, uniting or unifying than for someone to say, I messed up or I dropped the ball or I'm sorry, or that just wasn't for me. Or that wasn't my best. When people are vulnerable and they show their humanity, it causes people to embrace them and, and bring them in and want to protect them and keep them safe, right? When you have ego, no one ever protects you because you you telegraph yeah. that you've got it all under control. Mm. And none of us do have it under control. Like everybody <laughs> no. needs help every now and again. And everybody needs somebody to mm. say, you did a great job, kiddo. That You don't get a you did a great job, kiddo, when you walk through the world like you're the best thing ever. There's no, there's no mm. soft space for you to land. And I, I don't want to ever um, feel that. And I, and I also want to always be that for someone. And also when you have ego, people don't necessarily um, open themselves up to you because they feel like you haven't experienced anything. You're so great. Mm-hmm. You're so above it. I ain't above nothing. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. I'm literally wherever you are, I'm right there with you. I'm right. I, the mm. thing that breaks my heart more than anything is if, you know, sometimes on Twitter or something, you'll respond to someone and they'll go, I can't believe you responded to me. I'm just a regular person. I'm like, yeah. baby, I'm just a regular person too. Like you I can't, just that, said that to someone yesterday. Yeah. yeah. It's like either yeah. either we're all special or none of us are. Either we're all important or mm. none of us are. This idea that it's bad enough when someone else, when someone themselves decides that they're special. Like I'm more important than anyone. I need the, everybody bow down. That's bad enough. It's even worse when someone else goes, that person's great and I'm nothing. I hate mm. that. You yeah. are wonderful too. It's, I love that you love my little TV show, but that does not make me better than you. It's Absolutely just a job. Not. It's a job. If you were to put a word, mm-hmm. if you were to look back at the beginning of your journey, mm-hmm. um, coming to Los Angeles and now, if mm-hmm. you were to give a word to your journey, what what would you what word would you use? Oof. You know, the word that first came to my mind was treacherous, and that's the reason I did not want to say that <laughs> is because it just seems like, you know, I'm like battling snakes and alligators and whatnot, but. A move to California, especially the way I moved to California, was really, I did not, I moved so dumb, you guys. Like I had a place to stay for three days and I had, I had saved $500. Thank God my aunt gave me another thousand on the way to the airport. She was like, you a fool if you think you're going to move to another <laughs> another state. This with sounds a place to stay for three days exactly with like my journey. Oh girl. This but sounds see, exactly listen, the same. God protects the <laughs> fools. He really does. Um, and so I think about now how many people come the way I came and didn't make it, either literally did not make mm. it, like lost their life because of the stuff that they got into here trying to make it work or who ended up having to, you know, go back home or people who lost th- their place to live. Like, this is not an easy place to start yeah. in, even if you have a place to stay. If you don't have a place to stay and mm-hmm. you don't have money saved, it is very dangerous. So. I did not did difficult. I don't want to say dangerous. I don't want to scare people. People chase your dreams. But um, <laughs> I say treacherous because it it sh- it should have not worked. <laughs> it should have mm. not worked. But God is good and he protected me. And a friend of mine's mom, Gloria, shout out to Gloria. My friend Diana's mom let me sleep on her love seat for, I think I stayed on mm. in our couch for three months. And then finally saved enough to get my own room and a house and and then built. But it was it was like sleeping on floors, sleeping on couches, riding the bus, um, anorexia because of finances. Like I, I got so thin and not because I didn't want to eat. I didn't have no money. And so I was eating like, listen, one, listen, listen. I, I look back and I was like, I I was so much thinner. And I was like, but why? <laughs> was I wasn't hungry. doing anything different. Because you were I hungry. literally had the epiphany. I was like, oh, I couldn't afford, couldn't afford meals. Food. It's a whole. It's That's a whole why I look like that. <laughs> it's a whole nother. It's a whole nother world. You can't afford <sighs> yeah. food. But the thing is, you're so hungry for your dream that you mm. just go, okay. Well, I'm gonna drink this water and eat this one dinner roll. I see one dinner roll, one scoop of instant mashed potatoes you can make with water. So one scoop mm-hmm. of potatoes, one dinner roll, and two dashes of a one sauce. And to me, that was a steak dinner, and that was all I would eat for the entire day. And I would eat it like it oh, was. Oh, that's well thought. That's a well, well thought, thought out meal, though. I'm telling that's- you, that bread, <laughs> that bread with that that A1 dash, it, it tastes a little bit like wow. meat. Wow. And then you got your potatoes with some salt and pepper. My mouth watered oh, just at the wow. thought of it because I remembered how how oh. that sustenance kept me alive. Kept me alive mm. for months and months and months. So I lost a lot of weight. So, you know, it is. But again, it's because you're chasing something that you dreamed about that it's okay. It sucks in the moment, but you like, I'm going to make it one day. I bet you, I bet you next year I won't be on this bus no more. <laughs> I bet mm. you next year I'm going to book something and I'll be able to buy some actual chicken. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> right? So you tell yourself that and you hope that it comes true. And then, you know, if you stand there, it does. What was the first moment when you were like, oh, I can buy some meat to accompany my <laughs> dinner roll in A1 sauce and Idahoan potatoes. You, how'd you know it was Idahoan? Idahoan, it sure was. Because um, they're the best ones yeah, and they're a dollar a pack. And you make them with water. <laughs> you can make them with water. Um, yeah, so probably probably the first the first commercial I ever did was a 1-800-CALL-ATT commercial with D.L. Hughley. And D.L. and I are still oh, wow. friends. We met on that on that commercial and he's always been very kind at every stage of my career. But um, when that first check came in, I was like, mm. oh, were they, 
they they <laughs> like to pay you. They believe in a little pay. It was pretty exciting. And then, you know, commercials pay well and unexpectedly, you know. So it was like I was in I was in chicken and, and rice with some broccoli for a minute. It was nice. Mm. <laughs> mm. Was there ever a time that maybe things in your career seemed to be on an upswing, but life felt like it was on a downswing? Oh, good Lord. I mean, I that was literally last year when my mom died. Like, and it has been other times, yeah. but you know, after yeah. my mom, my mom passed in May of 2021, and I got nominated for an Emmy in June of 2021. And worked the year of the year since my mom has passed, I have worked and had more opportunities come out of nowhere than ever. So a lot of those early, like I, I joked about this recently, I did an Instagram live and I joked about it because one of my friends said, how are you? And I said, I'm actually really happy. I said, for the last eight or nine months, I've been pretending (laughs) that I was happy. Mm. So I, I had to do press and stuff for you know, my show and, and different cartoons and stuff I do. And I was literally getting on camera and guys, yes, yes watch that. And then closing down mm-hmm. the computer and going to cry, you know, wow. or if it was a, a two dayer, I would cry and then put my makeup back on. Like, yeah, watch big shot. You know what I mean? It was like ridiculous. So there, there have been seasons like that, but you know, as performers, we're like, we're trained, right? So you, mm-hmm. you show up, you do your job and, the reality of your life is something that you have to figure out when you're on your private time. I'm more honest about things like that than I think most. Like I remember a couple of years ago, everything looked like it was just, oh, going from mountaintop to mountaintop. And behind the scenes, I had gotten a show, a pilot that I wanted to go, didn't go. And I broke up with this guy that I never should have dated, but I broke up with him. And Mm -hmm. I showed a picture of myself on Instagram crying. I'm like, cause you guys see me with my makeup done and looking amazing, but this is me on this Tuesday. I'm very yeah. sad. <laughs> and I'm showing you this now so that when next time you see me looking great on a red carpet, you'll understand that life happens to us all in the same way that, you mm-hmm. know, no one's special. Like we either we're all special or no one's special. Everybody goes through something. Even your favorite, even your favorite has a bad day. Even the person that you think is the most whatever in the world, they have a bad day. And we do each other a disservice when we act as if all we doing is going to Punta Cana and Dubai and buying mm, the purses mm. and look at my pretty lip gloss. Like that's, come yeah. on guys. Show the real. And it's okay to, to put up the pretty picture, but also be honest when it's a day that's not that great so that you can help somebody else get over. Because again, it goes back to, it's not just about you, right? And so if my, mm-hmm. if the images that I show make someone think that their life is crappy, And I know that my life also has moments that are not great and I'm not showing them on purpose because of what? Ego. Then Mm -hmm. I'm not not showing up in the world in the best way that I can show up in the world. Sometimes what you go through is the way someone else gets over. They learn from your cautionary tale. But when you're so wrapped up in ego that you don't want to show that your heart gets broken too, or sometimes you want a job you don't get, or sometimes you you know, have a financial situation that you can't get over in the moment. When you don't show those things to people, you're basically presenting as if life is sunnier on your side of the street. And it's not sunny anywhere all the time. When did you make a conscious choice to not do that anymore? Like, was there was there something that happened in your life when you were like, I normally would not share this in any public mm-hmm. sense, but actually I'm going to live even more transparently than I ever have. When did that shift happen for you? I think when social media became more and more prevalent everywhere, and I started hearing so much about how young women in particular, young people were struggling because everyone's showing their highlight reels. Everybody Mm. is like having the best day of their life every single day. And I just don't think it's just not true. It's just not, it's not true for me. Now, maybe there's somebody having a great day every day. It's not true for me. And so I felt, because I have a lot of younger people that follow me because of Drake and Josh and and even community probably, I decided that I want to show them an authentic view of what it's like to be in this industry, to be a single woman, what it is to be a woman of a certain age. And even with my birthday, I turned, um, my mother died when I was 49 and then I turned 50, like two or three days, two or three months after that. And up Mm. until that point, I had never 
told my age publicly. It was out there, but I'd never out my mouth said, I am this age. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, Hollywood says we're not supposed to and you shouldn't, you know. Yes, and I yes. turned 50 and I was like, I'm telling everybody. I was going to tell everybody mm. I'm 50. And I'm 51 now. And I just decided to do that because I felt like we're, women are handicapping ourselves into believing that life for us or careers for us end at a certain point. And in my mind- Speak on it. Yes. Right. In my mind, the fact that I am still alive is Mm. worth celebrating, first off. Second, if I really believe that what's mine is going to be mine, then me telling my age is not going to keep anything that's for me from Mm. me. And also, my face looks like my face. So even if I say I'm 75, (laughs) if I look 35, (laughs) I'm going to play 35. If I say I'm 51 and Mm -hmm. I look 40, I'm going to play 40. So it doesn't it doesn't really matter um, what people think. And I'm not trying to be nobody's ingenue anymore anyway. I ain't, I, listen, I just played somebody's mama who's in college. I'm not playing no college person ever again. <laughs> so joke's on me yeah. if I think telling people I'm 51 is going to stop an opportunity. Now, other actresses of different ages, don't y'all don't be like Auntie Yvette. Y'all do what's best for you. But yeah, I decided for me, you know, that I was going to be honest about it. And I have, not, I have no regrets I- about it. I think that's a good one. And I and I love that you're saying that because I've always been, I'm almost, I'll be 35 in December. Sweet little baby. But I've always oh, been. <laughs> but I've always been. Ears. <laughs> 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 no, but I've always been very transparent about my age. And it's yeah. because, because I mean, there's actresses that are my age, actors that will say that they're 24. Absolutely. Like, I just got off of a show playing a 19, 19 to 22 years old. So, I mean, right. I I can play a very large range. Right. But the reason why I've always found it incredibly important to be transparent about my age is because I want people to really know the true time that my journey has taken. Sure, you better say If it. you think <laughs> that I'm 25 then you don't realize that I've been in L.A. for almost 13 years. That's right. You don't know That's that. Right. That doesn't make sense because right. then I would have been like, you know, 12 or something. That doesn't make right. sense. <laughs> right. And it also prevents you from being a testimony to people that are trying to make mm. it. Because if you're 22 and you're starring on a Netflix show, then that means someone that's 25 or 35 and hasn't had their opportunity that they're they're behind. Right? So you're, you're automatically yes. making people feel less than instead of empowering them. If you say to them, I've been in this industry or this town for 13 years and I just got my big break at 32 or 30, then that go they go, okay, then there's still time for me. It imp- it's empowering instead of instead of um discouraging. And if you have a chance to mm. empower over discouraging people, you should take it. Cause it's not this is not yeah. an overnight success t- situation. Everybody I know, most oh people I know, at least with, with this, with the melanin. We got to, we get yeah. at least 10 years before you get your shot. Yeah. At least. They don't, they don't believe 1, in us. A thousand percent. Come on. I love that we both see that the same way. Because yeah. I, again, I think, I think that the reason we see it the same way though, is that uh, at the core of who we are, our, what we're doing is we want to inspire. Absolutely. And so we, if we're going to inspire, you have to inspire with authenticity and your yeah, true you story you and your true self. You gotta tell yeah, you stuff. You gotta, I love stuff. that. You gotta, sh- you gotta show you stuff. You gotta show you stuff. What does your gratitude practice look like? Oof. You know, I would love to say that I have a gratitude journal. Like in my heart, I have one, but it's it's here. It's all in. It's in my brain. It's in my it's in my notes app. It's on my Twitter page. It's on my Instagram page. I am et- eternally grateful for life. You know what I mean? Like this. Mm. It's such a weird. Uh, experiment we're all on. And you know, this crossed my mind the other day. I don't know what made me think about this. Every person on this planet is on this planet against their will. Or let me say it differently. Break not it against down. their will. Break it down. I mean, not okay. against their will. Because nobody that would make the scene that everybody trying to get out of here and they're not. I mean, everyone came here <laughs> without making the choice to come here. Think about that. Every single human being was born without choosing, without actively saying, I would, I mean, in heaven perhaps, but no one went to, no little zygote or a little egg went to their mom and said, you know, I'd like to be born. So can you get busy with daddy so that I can come mm-hmm. and experience life? No, we just all came here. Mm-hmm. And, and without choosing it consciously, we have to figure out something that we never chose, right? Like me moving to LA, mm-hmm. I chose that. 
So I had to figure out how LA works because it's something that I chose. It's my decision and I, I had to figure it out. I didn't choose to be a baby born in East Cleveland in 1971. My mom and dad chose that, right? So when you get here, you either lean into the experience of this life or you fight it. And we know the people that fight it. They just, you know, always mad and yeah. just, I don't want to, why I got to, you can, you mm-hmm. can war against the circumstances of your life or the circumstances of your birth, or you can figure out this is a great puzzle and a great adventure. And I need to figure out, cause that's what I would do in East Cleveland. Like I was, I was like, I had to figure out how to make this work for me. I got to figure out, cause I know what I want to do. I know who I want to be. I know where I want to live. And that is a thousand leaps away from where I am right now. So let me, let me dig into this puzzle and figure out if I move this piece here or I do this, how can I do this? And also enjoy the adventure of it, right? The adventure of it includes moments on the bus or sleeping on somebody's floor or heartbreak because you chose the wrong dude. This is part of it. Now I'm 51. I'm going into the the elder years of my life and there's body aches and whatnot and and stuff that, you know, work might be changing for me. That's exciting mm-hmm. to me. I'm like, mm-hmm. ooh. And even, this is what's crazy. And people know how hard I mourn my mother and I'm still mourning my mother. Even the journey of being a motherless child on this earth is another piece of the puzzle. So now I have to find a way to, to put into motion everything Fran put in me. And how do I become the greatest living legacy to that tiny little amazing woman while I'm still here? How do I continue yeah. her footsteps, right? That's another, that's another part of the puzzle. So that means I can't lose myself in this grief because that's not honoring who she is, right? Mm. So if, if the goal is to be the fullest expression of the child she created, honoring myself as well, then I got to get busy doing that. It's all puzzle yeah. pieces. It's all pieces of this adventure. And I choose to see it as a great adventure. What has been your takeaway from our conversation today? Well, besides how beautiful my soror is, that sweet little chocolate brown <laughs> face, just so pretty. <laughs> Aside from that, I love you. Um, just as I love you too, honey, that it's just good to, you know, to talk things through and to share, to share your journey. Yeah. Yeah. My takeaway is to be more mindful of embracing the adventure of life. I just want to be more mindful of it, to be mindful of the way that I'm viewing life or a season, Mm. a particular season in my life. Um, And like I said, you know, Yvette, you are someone who inspires me so much. And you not only inspire me as an artist, but you just inspire me as a woman. Um, You, Mm -hmm. through your life, you teach me how to live a better one. Oh, so yeah. So So I just want you to know I love you. I I thank you. you, And I honor you deeply and truly. Oh, thank you, sis. After the credits... The person Yvette thinks is most deserving of a spa day. Thank you for listening. This podcast is produced by LWC Studios for OWN. The show's executive producer is Juleka Lantigua. Managing producers are Camille Stennis and Paulina Velasco. Editing assistants from Jordan Cowling. Mixed by Kojin Tashiro. Assistant producers are Michelle Baker and Shanice Tindall. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, and we hope you do, please make sure to subscribe, leave a rating, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to ensure you hear the next one. If you could bring someone from history to Mm. present day, who would it be and what would you want them to experience? Oh, somebody from history to present day. Gosh, that's good. I probably would go with Harriet Tubman. Mm. I just love, I would love the idea of her having a spa day. (laughs) Oh, you know what I mean? Like I would love for her to just get a good soak and a good massage and somebody to paint her nails and shampoo her Mm -hmm. hair and, you know, give her like some Bantu knots and, you know, a a bomb twist (laughs) out. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then take her to like a really nice restaurant, let her get to have some really good food and have somebody serve her 
somebody serve her, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that there's so many of our ancestors that did not get to experience the luxury of life and even just being okay and not being on the run or being under attack all the time. And I would love to pull some of those queens from from our history and give them a really good day. We ain't have to save mm, just nobody. Just a good day. Just a good day. day. You gotta save nobody, girl. Go wow. on, eat this steak. Go ahead and steak and potatoes. Mm-hmm. This for you, Mary. Go on. <laughs> Get your tub now. I love that. That's beautiful, Yvette. <laughs> 